story and how I came to LaSalle and what it is that we do here. Um, and then I'll also give you a little bit of a context for the work that we do at LaSalle. And by we, I mean myself, the graduate students with whom I work, and then sometimes there are some undergraduate students that work with us too. Um, so I am a, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology here at LaSalle. I am a clinical and health psychologist. For me, that means I was trained uh, both in health psychology and in clinical psychology. And really what that means is health psychology focuses on the intersection of kind of health and medicine with psychology. So I was trained in, in both that and clinical psychology, which is more, I think, traditionally what you would think of when you think of a psychologist. So people who work with people who have depression or who have anxiety disorders. And my particular area of in people with weight and eating related difficulties. So I went to the University of Pittsburgh, got my PhD, and then I did what's called a postdoctoral fellowship afterwards at Temple University's Center for Obesity Research and Education. We worked there for a little over three years where um, I worked on various clinical trials, so trials that are funded by the government or different agencies to try to improve treatment for people with weight difficulties. And then I also created a treatment for people who um, are emotional eaters and are also trying to lose weight. So I did all that and then I came to LaSalle about four years ago, a little less than four years ago. Um, and at LaSalle, I teach in both the doctoral program, so LaSalle has a science So as part of my role and responsibility in the psychology department, I'm one of the faculty members who supervises students seeing people in the community for a variety of different difficulties. And so um, this clinic, we have a clinic as part of the psychology department, and it's housed in what's called the Sal University Community Psychological Services. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's why you couldn't find it. It's not that easy to find online, um, it's located in St. Benilde, actually over by nursing. Um, and the clinic that I supervise is kind of a small part of that larger clinic. So that's kind of who I am and how I got to be where I am now. And as I mentioned before, most of what I do now focuses on understanding and trying to promote um, better treatment of individuals with weight and eating. So you may have seen some of this information before, some of it may be new to you, um, but nevertheless, I, I think it's a nice way of providing some context for why we do what we do. So this is a visual depiction of uh, the trends in obesity among US adults starting in 1990 and then every decade. So you can see down here, it's the, uh, I, I like how it's color coded and it gives you the percentage of individuals who would fall in um, who would be considered to have obesity. And what that means is having a body mass index, which is a ratio of uh, weight to height. So having a body mass index greater than or equal to 30. So you can see in the 90s, most of the percentages were relatively low. So most were below 20%. <coughs> and this was done in 2010, where you can see there's a pretty significant proportion of the United States where the percentage of individuals with obesity is greater than or equal to 30%. So over the past two and a half decades, uh, the prevalence rates have increased. So there's um, a real drive, and I know you've learned a little bit about this, but a drive to really better understand what we can do to prevent um, unhealthy weight and to promote healthy weight among children as well as among There are lots of different things that contribute to these different rates of uh, weight difficulty. So a lot of times people think about it, unfortunately, I think a lot of times people blame the individual. And um, what we know is that it comes back to this idea of nature versus nurture. So it's not really an, an individual problem. It's really um, a combination of the way that they put it uh, at the Yale Red Food Center is that genetics load the gun and if the environment pulls the trigger. So really speaking to this 
interaction of a genetic predisposition, genetic predisposition to having an unhealthy weight, and then that's exacerbated or expressed because of all these different things in the environment. Can I ask questions, or do I have to? No, please. Okay, okay. So, can anyone think of some potential environmental factors that could contribute to, or that could fall into what pulls the, the trigger on the gun? Mm -hmm. That's due to Okay, good, yep. So access to fast food, access to high calorie foods definitely play a role. Good stuff. Lack of access to like places exercise. Great. Yeah, so what we call sometimes what's referred to as the built environment. So the environment in which an individual lives. And you can think about people who are living in neighborhoods that are unsafe, that may not have the economic resources to go to a gym or to have these workout facilities, and so therefore how are they able to exercise? Again, we know that uh, genetics play a really significant role in the development of weight difficulties or an unhealthy weight. For obese children, for example, or children with obesity, the risk of becoming or having obesity as an adult is much higher than children without obesity in um, childhood. So again, really speaking to the biological or genetic nature of this. So environmental factors. Talked about the availability, um, also the cost of food and food advertising. So I know that part, this is an online journalism class, right? So you're probably pretty familiar, and also if some of you are communications majors, about the role that advertising plays in uh, the, the purchasing and consumption of different foods. Portion sizes, you may or may not have heard about this, um, but I'll, I'll give you some examples in a moment. But we know that over the past couple of decades, the portion sizes have significantly increased, and then also the characteristics of the built environment. And then we also know that uh, social, social factors, like social support, the amount of stress that a person's experiencing related to their social network, um, cultural factors. So can anyone think of some examples of social or cultural factors that could play a role in in eating habits or in weight? Right. Or even from your own knowledge or your own experience, are there certain social situations or certain ways in which you think your eating habits could be affected? Yeah, sure. So if you're around people who eat a certain way, or certain events. So if that's a part of your culture, then you may be more exposed to those types of foods. So you can see that in terms of the um, exploring nutrition and the environment in which LaSalle is located, some of these factors like the availability or the cost of food can really play a significant role. So people who live in what's called a food desert where there are very few fresh Places where the only place to purchase food is in corner stores, for example, and the price of a hub is cheaper than the price of a bottle of water. So that's a really good example of where environmental factors can kind of trump everything else. So similarly, another concern or question here, or another judgment is that, are these conscious choices that people are making? And the answer is really, again, when you're served these enormous amounts of food, the portion sizes are so big, there's a lot of research showing that it's very difficult to decrease your caloric intake when you're constantly faced with all of these enormous um, amounts of food. And it's not really about willpower, that it's about so many other factors, about mindless eating, not having the time, not having the resources, so part of what we do, which I'll get to in a minute, is help people kind of make different choices and make the most of the environment with which they're connected. So 
a lot of these things would be addressed by policy changes or public health changes. Where psychology sometimes comes into place is with behavioral factors or psychological factors. So this would include things like mindless eating. So we, um, in the treatments that we provide, a lot of times we'll teach uh, mindfulness skills or mindful eating. So slowing down the process of making different food choices, paying attention. So how many of you, I've, I've done it, paying attention, instead of paying attention, um, to what you're eating, you sit down and you eat something while you're watching a movie and the next thing you know, it's gone. And does that ever happen to anybody? Okay. So that's an example of mindless eating. And when we go through our day, when we sit at our desk or we are studying and we're eating and the next thing we know, we've just eaten that entire bag as opposed to the handful that we wanted. That's an example of unintentional or mindless eating. Other things like skipping meals or going long periods of time, those are all behaviors that we can help people change so that they can feel like, all right, I can make different choices to start to change my eating and start to change my weight. So this is what um, a typical behavioral weight loss treatment would look like. These are the major components of the treatment. This is part of what we do in our clinic. It's not a cookie cutter approach and it's not Weight Watchers. That's a question that we get a lot. Um, it's much more individualized, but these are some of the basic components that we incorporate in most of the treatments. So what happens in our clinic is someone will call up and say that they have, uh, that they're interested in um, changing their weight or changing their eating habits. Um, then they'll go through the process of um, interviewing with a student clinician to learn more about what, it, what difficulties they're having, what they're looking for, and then they'll be transitioned to someone who will work with them in an individual setting. And oftentimes the treatment will incorporate these components. There's a lot of research showing that these components are actually one of the most effective ways of helping people um, change their eating patterns and achieve a healthy so I'm not going to go through all of these in a lot of detail, but I'll give you some examples of um, both the self-monitoring and stimulus control. So goal setting is kind of what it sounds like, helping people break their goals down into smaller pieces so that people feel like they can achieve. Sometimes um, when people feel like they want to lose 30 or 40 pounds or 50 pounds, they can feel insurmountable. So breaking that down into smaller goals and then helping people figure out how to do that alternate ways of um, coping with difficult situations and preventing that. So let me just give you, so these are, this is what it looks like. There's usually a predetermined number of sessions. We in our clinic have a lot more flexibility, um, meaning that sometimes we'll see people for six months depending upon what they need and, and how long they need treatment. We do see people for about 50 minutes each treatment begins with or incorporates um, a weekly weigh-in because usually the one of the treatment goals is to achieve a healthier weight, so we want to be able to help that person monitor their weight. There's some component of nutrition education, physical activity, um, changing eating behaviors, changing some of these environmental factors that contribute to eating behaviors, and then changing the way that people kind of think about their eating. So let me give you some examples.
roadmap, it's sort of a way of empowering people to make different choices. So this is kind of what it looks like. We'll ask people, and I brought some examples with me too. We'll ask people what time, what it is they're eating, how much they're eating, and um, how many calories they're consuming. And if you recall back at one of the earlier slides, we do give them a calorie range. So the idea is that they're trying to stay within this general calorie range um, that will help them achieve this healthier weight. And then this gives them an idea, gives people an idea of, okay, where might I be able to cut back a little bit? They're also similarly monitoring their physical activity. And this is something now that we, we still have people do it using paper and pencil, but there are lots of other ways that people can self-monitor. So I'm sure you all know that there are tons of phone apps out there that people use. There are lots of um, blogs. There are a lot of online support groups. So the, the kind of electronic resources for self-monitoring and for um, monitoring the changes that people are making has really grown significantly. So that's one really important core piece of what we do is helping people monitor their behaviors, monitor triggers of certain eating behaviors, and kind of understand what's contributing to that so that they can make better changes. So now I'm going to ask you, what, <coughs> what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see this? What's one of the first things that comes to mind? Dan Rodden. Popcorn? Dan Rodden and popcorn. Okay. <laughs> so, and what else? Right. So Dan Rodden theater, popcorn, what else might come to mind when you're looking at a Soda, candy, popcorn, okay, and that, that's really common. How many of you thought, within your first like five things that you thought of, thought of a food or a drink? Okay. And this? It's my favorite. Jimmy's. Ice cream, Jimmy's, right? These are just pictures. They're not the actual food. They're just something that's associated with that food, that we have learned to connect or to associate with food over time. And so what, what we do, this, is, this goes back to the idea of stimulus control. So it's really helping people relearn to pay attention to all these different things in their environment, in our environment, that we've kind of learned to cue thoughts of food or cravings of cert for certain types of food or hunger, what we call external hunger. So how many of you have had, what, what does it feel like when you feel hungry? How do you know you feel really hungry? What do you notice? Your stomach growls. I get mad. You get mad. What else? All I think about is food. Okay. Sometimes people get headaches. They feel lightheaded. They feel... Uh, you're probably all hungry, so I'm probably <laughs> exacerbating it right now. But has anyone ever finished eating, you know you're full, and then you say, no, you know, I'm really hungry for fill in the blank. So raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. So that's what we call external hunger. So it's not a physiologically driven hunger. It's usually driven by something else. Something in the environment, for example, or an emotion or a thought. So what we do is we help people figure out, okay, is this real hunger or is this kind of a craving or is this driven by something else? And then figure out how can we change our environment so that we decrease the likelihood of having these constant so if I walk into my house and I have cookies all over the place and I have cake sitting out, then no matter how hungry or full I am, I'm going to want those cookies. Mm -hmm. But if I walk into my house and there's no food anywhere, I might be less likely to think about cookies or think about cake. So for those of you who are familiar with any um, psychology, this connects back to some of the work that Pavlov did with conditioning. And the idea is basically when you pair a stimulus with something else, those two things become connected over time. So initially, when you go to the movie theater, you just go to the movie theater and you just watch a movie. But that day, when you start to introduce the popcorn, and as a kid, you have popcorn every time you go, and over time, you could just see that movie theater and you think of popcorn. You don't think of movies, you think of popcorn. So that's one These are some of the other things that I think psychology brings to um, helping people change their eating habits and change their weight. So for some
some folks, they're coping with other things like um, emotional or stress-related eating. So sometimes it will help people learn alternative ways of coping with difficult emotions or dealing with stress. There's also something called um, binge eating or binge eating disorder, which is an eating disorder. So obesity is a, a health condition um, and it's not an eating disorder, but there's a subset of folks who have an unhealthy weight who also have binge eating disorder. It's about, generally about one to five percent of the population. And for those folks, there's a different form of treatment that can be really helpful. So as psychologists, we play a really important role. And we do treat a lot of folks with binge eating disorder in our clinic, too. And then we also find that, that people with um, other psychological disorders, in addition to an eating disorder, so with depression, for example, um, sometimes weight difficulties can come along with that, too. So in those situations, we want to make sure that we are treating both and not just kind of paying attention only to someone's weight. I can, I'll just finish, I'll ask, I guess, see if there are any questions at the end. Um, but if there's something that one of you wants to ask while I'm going through, then you can just stop me. So the other important piece is that I think, um, when I think about what we do, what my students and I do, one of the things I think is important to Consider, both in terms of um, helping people with weight difficulties and also kind of more globally thinking about um, what role we as a society can play, um, is thinking about the role that bias and discrimination, specifically weight bias and weight discrimination, play. So um, the prevalence rates of weight bias and discrimination have increased by about 60% over the past 10 years. And um, Unfortunately, and sometimes surprisingly, you might expect that, oh, you only see weight bias in um, community samples, but it's actually quite prevalent. So physicians, students who are in training for a health profession, dietetic students, um, health professionals that specialize in treating individuals with weight and eating disorders, all, there, there's some research documenting that weight bias is prevalent across all of those. And weight bias means that people are kind of underestimating the role that biology, genetics, and environment play, and overestimating the role that individual factors play in um, weight difficulties. And what happens is, over time, when people are exposed to bias and discrimination, it actually can exacerbate weight difficulties, eating difficulties, cause um, lead to um, psychological difficulties like depressed mood. I mean, if you think about it over and over, day after day, just like other forms of bias and discrimination, um, it can be quite insidious. So there's been a movement to try to raise awareness of um, the prevalence rates of bias and discrimination, um, increasing sensitivity to some of these issues, and also addressing it in treatment directly when you're working. bring this back to what we do here. As I mentioned before, our clinic is part of LaSalle University's Community Psychological Services Center. Um, and that center is, uh, has a lot of different subclinics, if you would, within it. Um, each clinic is supervised by a licensed clinical psychologist who is a part of the psychology program here at LaSalle. And so our clinic, my clinic that I supervise, is the Health and Healthy Weight Clinic. That's what we call it. So all of the, that, the entire clinic, including our sort of subclinic, provides um, low cost sliding scale services to members of the community. We do not accept insurance. So we are really working with, we certainly have members of the community who are of higher SES and, and could afford more services and um, I think a large proportion <coughs> of the individuals that we see both in our in the subset of the clinic that I supervise as well as the clinic at large um, are individuals who may not otherwise be able to afford services. So we're really providing an important service to members of the community. So 
So in terms of my clinic specifically, we provide individual and when we have enough folks, uh, group services. So the individual services, again, are focusing primarily for people who have eating and weight related difficulties. And um, usually that's not the only thing that they're struggling with. So it's usually many other things that are going on at the same time, but our treatment is focusing primarily on addressing it. So again, we are not providing this cookie cutter approach for more individualized treatment depending upon the person's needs. Um, so we have this really in-depth assessment period where we try to figure out how we can best help the person. And then the groups, when we have enough people, the groups are a similar context. Um, ideally, they're anywhere from four to about 10 people and run usually about 12 weeks. So in addition to this, some of the work that I've been doing with students outside of the clinic are um, within the university and the undergraduate students in particular. So in terms of research, uh, the students that work with me, we've been doing some research trying to understand factors related to eating behaviors in college students, particularly emotional eating, as well as um, examining weight-related attitudes and bias among health healthcare providers in student health centers. So this is actually a, um, a dissertation that one of my students is doing. And so I, as a, um, in conclusion, I just wanted to provide some additional resources if you're interested in learning more. There are lots and lots of different options, but um, these are some places where you can go to get some more information if you're interested. And I will send you the slides too. So, yeah, okay. yeah. so the, this first one, they have a lot of information about all of these things, but they have probably the most information about weight bias and weight discrimination out of these three sites. These two, I think, are probably pretty self-explanatory. Okay, and this is my email address. If you have any questions, you can feel free to. So, any questions, comments? Now, so you help with students and like community with at the obesity. Center? Ah, good question. Yeah. So. Um, our clinic is exclusively focused on members of the community. Okay. So students, um, let me take that back. LaSalle students get services through the LaSalle Health Center. The only exception is there was one time we ran a weight loss group and there were some LaSalle students who participated in that because it wasn't a service that was being offered at the time by the LaSalle uh, Counseling Center. We will sometimes see students from other universities um, for a variety of reasons that I won't get into, but LaSalle students are seen through the counseling center partly because of the, um, the coverage that you have that LaSalle students get through the university. And is the center open during the summer and like when we're not? Yes. Yep, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. so we're open year round. We have evening hours, weekend, weekend hours. Sometimes the hours are changed a little bit in the summer, but we are staffed and run year round. We close. I think for one week over the winter break, like one week in between semesters, but that's really it. We also, I should note, we do not provide any emergency services. So um, this happens less with the folks that, that I work with, um, but we do see folks with lots of different presenting problems, and so we're not a crisis center, so if someone has an emergency, then um, we do not see them under those circumstances. We're just not equipped to do that. Good question. So the way that it works is they are, all of the actual clinicians are doctoral students in training. So they have had at least one year in the program, um, and it can be anywhere from a second year student all the way up to fifth year student. All of the students are supervised by licensed clinical psychologists. 
Um, and that supervision could include both a group supervision as well as individual supervision. Meaning we meet as a group and talk about concerns or um, difficulties, review cases, and then also meet one-on-one. -on -one. But all of the clinicians themselves are students in training. And um, every member of the community, um, this is actually across the board, anytime you get treatment anywhere, um, you get a, an informed consent so you're told that by all the people who come to our clinic are told your clinician is a student in training and they are supervised by a licensed clinical psychologist. So they all know. Now I assume all the like, uh, doctoral students are uh, through LaSalle yes. and not coming from other schools? No, correct. They're all LaSalle students. Yep. Uh, good question. Um, I can speak to my team is I would say I also think it's a function of the population so most of the folks that we see are probably middle-aged women um, most of whom are probably african-american in the clinic um, I would say probably well middle-aged to older women is the ones we see in the clinic I think there's probably a little bit more age range we do also have a team of uh, they're called clinic teams um, we don't call that in the community, but we call that kind of when we're referring to the different subclinics. So there's another subclinic that focuses specifically on providing services for children. So in that situation, obviously, the age range would be lower. So just anyone how how do they how do they find out about Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I feel like we could use some help with that. Honestly, um, you know, it, it's a lot of times it's word of mouth. Um, for me, I have tried to spread it through word of mouth, through talking to physicians, um, the contacts that I have just based upon who I worked with before I came here. Um, some of the supervisors will, will present grand rounds, so we'll go to different hospitals or different medical clinics to talk about our services, but we don't have any advertising. We have some pamphlets. I brought a couple with me. Um, so I think that's one of the things that we could probably use more of. We just we don't have an advertising budget or anything like that. Um, I did actually try to <laughs> to advertise through Craigslist once, and it didn't. Nothing came of it. What are some of the most common like eating problems that you see or deal with? And, like, what do you think causes them? Um, in our clinic, so what what I found is that usually when people come to our clinic, they oftentimes they've tried things on their own. So it's pretty. I found this is just my experience. I found that it's pretty rare for people to come and have no knowledge at all. Some people do. Some people have very little nutrition knowledge or very little knowledge about how to make behavior changes. And I think many folks have tried a little bit on their own and. Have that it's been really difficult, so they're coming for some extra help. And usually it's very difficult because they also have a lot of other stressors and or are experiencing <coughs> depression and or anxiety and or social stress. And it really may be and, so it may be social stress and environmental stress and depression and anxiety and then and many other health conditions too. So it's kind of this confluence of factors that just really makes it very difficult for people to implement the changes that they feel like they know they should make, but they can't really do. They can't figure out how to quite make it stick. So you asked how do we do that too? Is that, was that the second part of your question? Um, or did that answer your question? I think that answered my question. Okay. How is actually another question that we have. Um, yeah, that's a harder question to answer. Um, so the rates of successful weight maintenance are relatively, are not as great as we want them to be. So a lot of people can lose weight, and when it gets really hard is to keep that weight off. Um, so we as a field, I think, aren't really great at saying, all right, we know that if you do this, you'll definitely be able to keep that weight off. There are some factors that we know are helpful, like that self-monitoring, actually, or weighing oneself, um, but as far as we had this prescription to say, okay, 
when you're having X, Y, Z difficulties, we know if you do this, then that will definitely work. We're not quite there yet. So usually what we do is, we'll, that's why the individual assessment is so important. So let's say, for example, we know that someone is having trouble sticking to consuming certain foods because they are also experiencing depression. So then we would help treat the depression in addition to that so that we can kind of get rid of that barrier to making and maintaining those healthy changes. Um, for someone with an eating disorder, like binge eating disorder, there's a treatment, there are a couple of treatments that are effective, one of which is called cognitive behavioral therapy, which has to do with, uh, this is an oversimplification, but kind of changing the way that you think and see things, and then that in turn changes your, helps you change your, the way you feel and the behaviors. What was that? One more? <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind. So, have you heard of the Exploring Nutrition Program? Yeah. And what? Are you, is there any interest in joining I that? I, I am part of it. I just don't know too okay. much. So, you know, like, is there any, like, comments you have on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, I know less about that. Right. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, I'll just leave it at that. No, I mean, so originally, uh, 
developed. Um, this, there has been, and probably will continue to be, ongoing discussions of, about connecting what we do in our clinic to so the broader mission. So yes, definitely. So if you try to get more involved with that, would that be something you try and connect with that program? Yes, sure. Great job. Thanks very much for, for uh, coming by, you know. And, uh